situation. So, Good. Yeah. We're online. So hello, everyone. We're back with the Fuel Arts webinars, uh, following our tradition to speak about art and tech online. Uh, just to remind, we established the Fuel Arts webinars uh, to put together art, tech, and NFT startups and investors from the other side in one friendly and transparent environment, helping the both to navigate on the hot but tricky market of digital assets. Uh, actually, this uh, first uh, weeks of 2022 brought us uh, several outstanding news. Uh, first of all, uh, an NFT marketplace, OpenSea, received uh, 300 million investment, and now the company is valued for 13.3 uh, billion. So this case uh, makes OpenSea one of the most valuable private firms in crypto and the first decacorn uh, on the digital collectibles market and art is part of that. Then on January 10th, the one day after its launch, uh, Luke's Rare Marketplace sold 105 million in NFTs, presenting the best starting results in this sector for a a uh, startup and art NFT marketplace. But at the same time, Wikipedia refused to consider NFT as art, uh, deleting information about the people sale from the list of the most expensive artworks. So uh, in order to put a light on the definition between art NFT and non-art NFT, we decided to invite an opinion leader in um, managing and creation of uh, digital art. So I'm happy to welcome with us uh, Christina Steinbrecher Fund, uh, a serial entrepreneur with more than 15 years of expertise in building and creating art marketplaces. Uh, hi, Christina. Let hi. me introduce you a bit more, but I'm pretty sure that everyone uh, knows you, though it's my privilege, opportunity, and the Big luck having you here. So Christina was the co-founder, executive director of the art fair Vienna Contemporary and uh, managing and artistic director of Vienna Fair and Art Moscow. And uh, she was also creating projects with uh, leading international art institutions. And then surprisingly for the Art Society uh, in 2018, she moved to San Francisco, establishing her own art tech startup called blockchain art. Uh, just to remind, my name is uh, Denis Belkevich. I am uh, the general partner and co-founder of uh, Fuel Arts, the first uh, art tech and NFT accelerator, which empowers the potential of art tech startups. And uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, my co-host today, one of the best financial analytics uh, I know, uh, Senor Diego Berrio, the co-founder and uh, partner at Amadeo Global VC Fund, Venture Capital Fund from New York. Hello, Diego. Diego, Sorry, you're I'm muted. Hi, hi, Dennis. Hi, Christina. It's a great pleasure to be today with you here. Thank you. So, uh, with both our tech, NFT, financial, and uh, institutional investment uh, sites, we'll be asking Christina questions and navigating the rest of our audience through the NFT world. So, um, Christina, my, my first question is uh, with your longstanding background in running art fairs and uh, being involved in various facets of the physical art world. So what influenced you mostly to transit to the digital world? I think quite frankly, my transition started pretty early or not like not even a transition, right? Because dealing or being um, in the art community, you see obviously a lot of digital art anyway, in museums in galleries, you talk to artists. And I think for me, it was quite striking probably around 210 when um, when I was running um, Art Moscow that artists were talking to each other it's like yeah it's 
I did this piece, I did this video, and um, but my gallery has a hard time showing that at a fair or selling that or sort of getting, even before selling, getting notable feedback from collectors or from institutions on digital pieces, right? They just don't know how to collect it. They just don't know. And in art fairs, it's they don't know if it's worse because you have in an art fair, you have a set square meter and they are quite expensive per square meter. So you want to use that, right? So you want to maximize the output and to show digital work was considered quite risky. So I had that in mind and was working with it. And then I'm uh, myself personally from not a center, right? I'm, I'm, I was born and raised in, in Kazakhstan and uh, then moved in the 1990s to Germany. So the particularities of people and of artists that are outside the center were always on my mind. And it was, had a lot to do with the schedules of people, of curators traveling. <clears throat> so naturally, curators would see less work of artists that are not in the center. So this was really always on my mind. So how do we give a platform to artists that are not in the centers? And in 2012, so 11, so basically starting in 2010, I developed with a colleague the concept of the V Museum, virtual museum. And we staged that uh, once in, in Moscow and once in Berlin. In 2012, we did it in Berlin. <clears throat> and uh, uh, curiously, Alexander Forbes of uh, Now Artsy, he reviewed it. He, he did a really nice review. And uh, it was very, very positive, sort of, this is the future, this is where it's going. And, um, but, so I was working with the Volkwagen Museum. So I convinced them to give me high end, uh, high resolution reproductions of their work. And I did a curation with emerging artists and with their collection. And they were like, it's too early. We want people to go to our museum. We don't want them sort of to get lost in other spaces. We want everyone to go into this one space. And I said, but not everyone can go to your museum. It's in Germany, it's in, in that particular town. And it was just too early, but it really struck a nerve further with me to go down the line and to find solutions. So how can we bring audiences to art and how can we bring art, art to audiences, right? And this is always, and I thought digital art is definitely the most purposeful way to do so. I mean, what else can you do? I mean, you have the cost, the insurance cost, the shipping cost of physical work. Of course, logical, it's digital art, right? So it's back then, it was a memory stick or a drive that you would take, and it was just possible. But it seemed that many more hurdles needed to be taken. So this was basically my entryway of really recognizing the potential and the opportunities um, and the struggles that artists had back then with digital art. And, and Christina, so from those, let's say, early initiatives uh, back in Berlin, um, well, if we fast track to 2019, you, you founded Blockchain Art. Uh, and uh, so what, what happened in, in, in between? And um, so how do you come up with, with that idea? I mean, I'm laughing because you say 219, right? 219 is in the blockchain world and in the crypto world known as crypto winter. So it was a particularly shitty time to actually start any company in that field. But what happened in between? So I was then basically going uh, forward. I was running for 10 years uh, art fairs, right? And really, really um sort of soaked up the challenges and the needs of all people in that community really understanding how is everyone motivated what do they need and i started and i started really to trying to find a solution for that problem right for really it was sort of where is the problem so artists were making more digital work and there was this conversation about new media. If you, I, I'm sure Dennis uh, remembers that. It was like conversation and panels and forums about the new media, right? So there was this push from the 
creative side, from the artist side, from curator side, let's do, engage, let's buy more, let's show more. But still, the market was never reflecting that. So if you would read uh, any statistics, right, sales reports till 2021, digital art was never mentioned as its own sort of um, group in, in sales. It was never mentioned because there was no statistics that was neglectable, so to speak. And um, so, so that happened. I was really looking for a solution and I started doing sort of panels also in during the fair and trying to get tech people on board, right? So I was like, tech people, let's talk to tech people. What do they say? Let's engage with them. But basically leading up to 18, it's not tech people haven't really thought about a solution for the art market because it was like a parallel world. It's like tech people would talk about their products. And it's like, let's, we want to make SaaS products and we want to do that. But it was never a conversation. It was everyone just talking about whatever they do. So it was very sort of in the art market. It so seemed so complicated. So it was very hard to really spin that conversation. So I started coming to San Francisco from 16. And the only thing you could do basically in San Francisco uh, was to go to meets, right? Meet up. And so I was like, so what's going on here? So I joined the blockchain conversation because it was very prominent at the time, right? It was um, the, the time in 16 was blockchain basically rolling out for industries. Like how can uh, blockchain be adopted? I don't know, by the automotive industry, by the insurance industry, but it didn't go anywhere. So the industries were testing it out, but it didn't go, go further. There was like no spark, but the idea really stuck with me. And then uh, later I learned about the NFT, the early application of an NFT and thought this was a, this, this is it. This is what I want to do. I want to bring that tool to the community and to the industry that I love. I want to bring that tool to basically to the clients that I got to love deeply in doing fairs. I want them to use that tool and be able to engage, sell NFTs. NFTs, in my regard, I was thinking digital art, right? So it's basically digital art. And then came, and then so basically it has this also file sizing restrictions for now, et cetera, et cetera. But generally it's like, I look at it as a tool. I wanted to make it um, available to the industry. I then moved to San Francisco and basically hit a wall, quite frankly, in 2019. I hit a strong, like a very serious brick wall in um, trying to engage in San Francisco or in the Bay Area with on the investor end with talking about blockchain for the art industry. It, it, was, it was a serious, like hit a wall um, over and over and over again. But um, since I'm like I'm in, in the in the heart of tech, so let's uh, let's let's continue this journey. I met my co-founder Misha in San Francisco, and uh, we've been sort of pitching. And it was also then because I came basically from the European context, and I had to learn in many ways the vocabulary of the VC, how they see the world, right? So it's a different take on, on the world, so to speak. Also, quite frankly, on what art is and, and how art is viewed, et cetera, et cetera. So in order to pitch to that audience, I felt it took iteration of me pitching, talking, understanding, okay, we might be using the same term, but the, the underlying um, take on what that term means is different. So, right. So for me, going um, into conversation after conversation, I sort of was learning how could I talk to my um, conversation partner in a way that to get my idea across. I think this was really important for me that time is this learning. How do I get my idea across in a way that makes sense for the other and how can we come to to a common understanding of what different terms mean
and, and Christina, that's, that's amazing and that, that you mentioned. And I would like to ask you a couple of follow-on questions there because this transition to Silicon Valley is, is I mean, it's many, many founders think about it, right? And uh, I, I just would like, and, and most founders always look at the, the exits and the success, but they, they don't spend a lot of time thinking that also there's challenges when you start this journey in, in the, as you said, hard tech. So how does it look for a founder with, with, a, with a dream and with a mission to get to Silicon Valley without having a tech background uh, and then that that would be the first question. The second question is, how do you use, how how would you describe that investors or venture capitalists look at see the world and how did you transform your your pitch, let's say, to be able to convey that message that you that you had? So maybe I start probably with uh, with the 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 second question is. Um, so the what and I, I guess I can speak to in many ways for myself. So yes, I'm a non-technical founder. And of course, I came in the arts context a lot to the US, I mean to New York, to Miami, right? And we and it was always the contemporary art context. In 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 that context, terms are globally defined so you have that community that talks about sort of the same things attaches mostly the same values and now i'm talking to the vcs and i'm telling you it was really uh, as i said like high speed against a brick wall it was just really high speed against a brick wall and going again and again and um and also my understanding, because obviously, I don't know, you you cannot help it. Uh, it's like a little bit like with, in Europe, news about soccer. Right? You don't want to know anything about it, but you still know everything. So the same is with tech news. So you might not want to know anything, but then you sort of get it from the media news about the Silicon Valley. You cannot escape from it. It's like everyone is, the radio, the, the newspaper, everyone is talking about it. So obviously I had some sort of preconception what the Silicon Valley is, right? So founders, and I mean, I have, was in um, executive positions fairly early on, right? So I understand what an executive position is in the, the European world. And also I learned many different lessons on the way being a fairly young woman in a mainly male dominated space in the executive world in Europe. So I'm like, and the Silicon Valley sounded like a dream, right? So you would have statistics and sort of this global marketing on, yes, we, we love sort of different founders and the ideas are appreciated. So with that sort of back, I arrived in the Silicon Valley. And um, well, it, it wasn't quite like that for me, right? So I'm, um, so 2019 was also, as I said, was crypto winter and people, even by the mentioning of, of blockchain, uh, got sort of unnerved, right? So it wasn't necessarily the high note um, to pitch. And, and also art was, um, almost negatively connotated in, in the Silicon Valley. It was connotated as um, probably something, and also in the US, sort of as a luxury segment. So it's like it's pure luxury, and art people only engage when they sort of made it. It's the top 1% thing to do, and sort of. So it's not a mass product. It's not, it's not suited for everyone to engage. So why talk about it basically, right? So it's sort of a hobby. And um, then um, since, I mean, I have sort of a fairly thick German accent, right? So, and I also had, had to learn that uh, it has, it's definitely uh, its boundaries. So I'm not, uh, um, 
an Ivy League tech student, right? So it's um, so it's I'm sort of this nebulous person that appears in front of a VC and says, I have this experience in a part of the world that that many do not have many associations with. They do not know how big the market is. They have no idea. Plus the subject matter is art, which is like, oh, that's a hobby. And it's all, you know, in, in that context, it wasn't concrete. I could feel on the other end, it wasn't, you couldn't like, okay, this is the size of the market. <laughs> this is like, this person has experience. I don't know if she has experience because I mean, she can, she comes from this part of the world. So it was these, mm, these boxes that I felt I couldn't tick, you know, in, in the first conversation. So I needed to learn how to make a point about my experience, et cetera, et cetera. So to prove that point that I'm actually knowledgeable of what I'm talking about. And what wasn't easy is the fact what I told you before is that, so when talking about digital art or NFTs and that matter in 2019, so investors would be like, yeah, that's sort of, that sounds interesting, but show me the growth of digital art in the last three years, 2019. And you're like, yeah, so there's like, there's the 60 billion art markets and about 50% the secondary, like from, uh, from intermediaries and so, but there's not like, we don't really have a statistics on digital art other than that the online market, so things sold online was growing at the time, like five, eight percent so it was sort of, sort of that online things being sold or art being sold online was growing that's sort of the only proof point at the time that is as like that cultural goods were actually consumed online that was sort of the only proof point but it was obviously in terms of vc pitching and what vcs would expect for a stellar case was fairly thin right so the only argument was Everyone has a personal PC. This is how many mobile phones everyone has. So you could construct like a logical argument, but obviously it would need quite a, like a leap of faith on the other side. And that was that. And what happened? And I thought, and I went through it. So I learned the vocabulary. I learned the pitch. I redid the pitch. I redid the pitch. I redid the pitch. And obviously you have to learn a little bit and so first you take everything face value right so it's like it's, it's like a boxing game for fairly and you get beaten up so you take everything face value because you feel like you want to sell so you take every comment literally and then sort of by doing many of those you understand that obviously the person sitting in front of you also has an approximate understanding of it so the the feedback given doesn't necessarily 100% apply. So you, it's not, um, so you have to choose in a way as an entrepreneur, what comments you actually, what do you think makes sense? So never lose your own vision in that, right? Never lose your own belief. And there are two things that I think is absolutely fantastic in the Silicon Valley, what I learned. It's one, no matter how sort of I felt I lose the box, I lost the boxing <laughs> match basically after these interviews, but it always was on a positive note. People were still sort of, I felt they left a mental note in their heads that there is something like this arts, people are making that, and there's this technology, like this connection between art and technology, they left a mental note. And that in the Silicon Valley, and I've never experienced that before, quite frankly, that uh, people are ready to make introductions constantly, right? So you meet someone and it's like, you should, and it might be 15 minute slots most of the time for a coffee for 15 minutes. And they're like, you should be talking to this and this person. And it might, and it might, and in most cases it doesn't lead to anything, but you learn, right? As an entrepreneur, you're sort of being handed over and this is in the most generous way. I felt people were handing me over to other people for my learning curve and in many ways for their learning curve or for their curiosity 
as in sort of as a one-off topic that is not necessarily in their line of investment, but something to, to think about. Mm-hmm. And this is really fantastic. And second, and it's not in these 15 minute slots, I mean, back then it was all in person. You would obviously go <laughs> around, around the financial district or would go sort of uh, around the valley and have 15 minutes conversations. And, uh, but also sort of fairly every executive will leave time in their schedule to do these 15 minute, 15 minute random calls or random meets, right? So it's not that you have to be another C-level VC executive to meet that other person, but it's really this generous giving time and this leap of faith. I really appreciated that and I feel um, that this is uh, this is really ingrained in the into the DNA of of the valley and being ready also to talk to founders. So I met most of the other founders that are doing NFT marketplaces back then, right? And it was this conversation. It's like, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? So it wasn't like this is my idea, but people, everyone was really sharing, and this is something that I really appreciate about the the place um that i got to work in good uh thank you christina so as a result of all of your pitches experience and moving from uh europe to the us you finally build the platform so let's shift our questions uh from the investment uh part to the artistic and tech part so uh now we all can use blockchain.art so how do galleries institutions and artists can use your platform. Just give us, please, uh, three cases for galleries, institutions, and uh, artists. So as I said, I'm coming with my experience from running fairs, right? So my first client that I had in in my mind was the intermediary, any form of intermediary, the gallerist, the agent, um, the, the artist representative, for them, giving a, t- a tool to them so that they continue selling art on behalf of the artist. And this is what we launched in the first place. And also intermediaries, um, I, I also consider basically institutions as an intermediary, as someone who didn't create the work. So what, how we do it is uh, you can fill basically an, an application, it's a submission. We then look at what you have, what you wanna do, uh, follow up with a conversation and then invite you basically uh, then go through an onboarding process and then you can um, onboard your artist and sell artwork and list uh, an artwork that you want uh, to sell and then you can basically also embed that link also onto your own website for right now <clears throat> we only uh, accept basically intermediaries um, as for now and in the next uh, phase so we just finished with a rewrite we are testing it right now also artists will be allowed to come on and also list their work and we will be also accepting um, cryptocurrency because in the initial uh, so in the initial in our beta we only accepted uh, fiat currency so for galleries so the logic was that galleries um, transact and work in fiat balances and budgets. So we wanted to make sure that this can be done. So this is how we roll. Mm -hmm. Cool. And what about collectors? How can they benefit from uh, your platform? So I think, I mean, sort of (laughs) quite a bit has happened last year, right? And um, so the, the our conversation, the webinar is called curated marketplaces. So I think in in our really esteem and in our logic, we want um, to onboard artists and work and galleries that um, represent art. So that is really an artistic focus on the NFTs that are out there. So we do not do collectibles. We really do want to place and want to work with art NFTs where the conversation is first about the artwork and where we believe in that this is um, yeah, strong work 
to be shown and to be sold. I have a, a, a small question here, like in terms of, uh, let's say, because you are not only giving a tool to the, to the, let's say, to the artist to present the work, but you are also, in a way, uh, being a channel for experience, for experiencing. In terms of quality, in terms of experience, how would you define the, the product? What are those things that you have, let's say, or your framework to make sure that the the, the, the artwork that you're exhibiting is exhibited actually in the best possible digital way? I think that's a beautiful question and um, I'll take that uh, by heart. I think there, there are two things about it and uh, sort of in our pre-conversation you said you were reading our white paper so and I think the ethos that I came into the NFT space was looking at technology as a as a tool that can give access to artists and can bring additional people in because you do not have to travel places, right? So you can actually see the work as it's intended to be on your screen. And number two, I been always when I was pitching also to VCs, I said, um, we believe that art is in and it's not the favorite term of the artist, it's it's a rightful investment, right? So it's not, I don't look at it as a flip, but I look at it as an artwork that will either sustain its value or increase in its value. So these are the two preconditions. So I every artwork that we see, we believe it will at least sustain its value because it's artistically strong, to do so. So and I think this is this is what what the ethos is of the company. And in terms of how do you technically represent it? So we uh, we can uh, we support NFTs up to and it, so basically technically we can support um, NFTs up to 500 megabytes. So sometimes it it works basically the upload it depends on 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 the moment sometimes, but basically we wanted to make sure that bigger file sizes than only 100 megabytes are possible. So to give artists a bigger flexibility basically in terms of what they want to work with, which is significant for an artist. And um, so it's uh, as just, it's probably common knowledge, but still, so it's not that you can take any file and upload it and make it an NFT, it's still technically limited um, by file sizing. So we make uh, we make sure that that's that that is possible. And uh, what you see right now, what is online, it's still sort of the beta version, and we will be going to the to the next to the rewrite very soon, so that you have a proper search mechanism so that you can look up art by gallery, by intermediary that is selling, by the artist or by the type of artwork. So that's going to be our next in order to um, increase that experience, right? So that you are when you're stuck to an artist and or if you really love a certain genre that you can actually scroll and really look more and get into into depth with that. And also as a second one, which I strongly believe that this will have also bigger relevance is um, that uh, if you buy an NFT, and I still believe you don't buy an NFT, you still believe you buy an artwork and uh, you want to display it at home. So it's this, but it's only on my phone, you know, no, it's not. You can actually work with that. So we ask all our, artists and our clients to actually give a recommendation how to install it at home All right so that that you give and and then i don't know picassos were also hung in the loo so it's not necessary that every client will will adhere to the recommendations but at least that there's a recommendation that you can go um, back to and uh, try to follow 
Dennis, sorry I interrupted you. Uh, Diego, do you have some other investment focus questions? I believe you do. Yes, yes, I, I, I do. Um, I, I was wondering also, like the, how the, like, I, of course, we've been through a, a, a big hype of uh, an NFT, especially, let's say, last year. But I was wondering what happened during the pandemic, right? Your, your engagement, not only, let's say, like building, building the company, and specifically, of course, uh, with investors to get basically the fuel to, to keep growing the business. Diego, that's, um, that's quite an intriguing question because there it's, it's been the high and lows of the pandemic as everyone had. So basically be shortly before the pandemic, we secured a big deal with a VC. So, and we were supposed to sign it at the end of February, 220. Yeah, so we, I've been working on that deal for, so in, of that investment for quite a long time, I'd say over and over into the conversation, showing the logic. And on their side, they had actually an art history major, like from the VC end. And then uh, end, of Feb end of February, everything is like, sorry, we can't do this because we have to save the assets of all our other portfolio companies then to invest in that new venture and God knows what's going to happen basically. Yeah. And so in a way in that, in, in that particular moment, you feel like, yeah. So the time you spend and sort of your dream with that went to through the toilet. Right. So that was like February, 2020. And, but, um, at, but at the same time, so I had uh, my co-founder and then we also uh, recruited another team member. We were like, whatever, right? So we believe in that and we did, um, so we, uh, uh, we funded basically our uh, alpha version ourselves, right? So we still went ahead with that and did it the, the classical way. I was drawing, uh, consumer journeys, right? User profiles. I was like writing them. And then my, my, my colleagues, so we've been having really in-depth conversation. It's like really this idea of that scrappy founder that does everything. So we did, we did all of that. We said like, okay, so every VC is really busy with themselves right now, trying to figure out what the pandemic means for them. And was like, if you remember, it was this huge panic, everything, the world is coming to an end. I don't know, everyone's like, we have to go to office, to home office. So it was these big human sort of questions that needed to be solved first before anyone could really think it's like how the future will look like. Really, it was it was February, March, April, basically till till about early, early summer. So we went ahead and bootstrapped the alpha version. And I started testing that in, in fall. I started testing that in fall 2020 with um with big clients and small clients with everyone with curators just really the alpha version but um i'm like whatever i have the alpha now so i did the cold calling approach so i did i sat down hours and hours researched vcs did beautiful excel sheets of of vcs that are were doing like did anything in that area just anything just fairly a, approximating uh, art or creative industry uh tried to work on my deck and was sending cold decks it's like hello i'm christina and i'm doing this fun thing and now it's the pandemic so let's engage a little bit in art you know so it was really cold emails and um i guess towards october november November, October, November, I was start, I started to get answers. <laughs> yeah. So it was very rare. People was like, this is curious, but no, no one really thought, as I understand, in a big way about it. But there I felt all of a sudden this impulse, right? So people cleared their problems, were actually developing a plan ahead, and they were ready to actually um, process information 
And I had all of a sudden many, many calls, many, many, I mean, ridiculous calls, fun calls, really frustrating calls, but many, many calls with VCs. And there was uh, a couple that would stuck, right? So that really stuck and was like, give me a call in two weeks and tell me what's new with you. And, and so I did, and I made sure to call back and was um, forming opinions or hypothesis where the world would be going in the art segment. And then we got the funding, right? So it still took then a while, I mean, a couple of months, but it feels obviously as a, as a founder that needs additional hands for building um, still sort of like an, an, an eternity. And then we got uh, the funding, we got into an accelerator and then we, and it was, uh, I don't know, all of a sudden to have actually money on the account that you can pay people and that you can decide it's like luxury problems to have, quite frankly, right? So it's like, oh, wow, you know, I can, I can choose now <laughs> how to work with. So it was uh, really um, it, such, a, such a learning curve also. Um, yeah, that's, that's how it went. It was really that I felt October, November, December, um, where I, I, I felt the interest of, of also angel investors and of people in the VCs that wanted to talk. But the hypothesis about that market, whereas the market is now reflecting, they're like all over the place, right? The market of NFTs are going, uh, yeah, in, in sort of it's now touching upon many more lives than we ever anticipated, right? And it's touching many, like it's going into many different forms that we didn't anticipate when we were going into that space. You know, you've just been talking about the increase of uh, investment attention towards the art tech and NFTs during the pandemic. But of course, we shouldn't forget that uh, in 2021, the uh, media created NFT boom. That it, it started with the famous uh, Beeple sale in March 2021. So, do you also believe that NFTs would make it without the global pandemic? I mean, of course, I was in there for the long haul, so uh, I couldn't. I mean, for me, that um, that the uh, that the non-fungible token would uh, be the tool for digital art to prosper. That's the reason why I got in. Uh, I didn't quite uh, expect uh, that scheduled media hype, but it was fantastic, right? All of a sudden, it's um, and just sort of another story. So we were trying to avoid the term NFT by all costs, in November, December, still in January, it's like, don't let's like, we don't mention blockchain, we don't say NFT, it's just gonna be unnerving for anyone we talk to. Let's just like, let's stick with terms people are fairly familiar with. And then uh, people did what people did, which was fantastic, making it mainstream, right? And uh, also, of course, there is a huge uh, information bubble, sort of the idea that everyone who's going to mint an NFT will be just like, it's just gold. <laughs> it's just it's just going like, I don't know, gold or it's going like, I don't know, uh, joints around and everyone will be happy with that. No, it's not, right? But it's still obviously um, made it main mainstream. And also, I have to say, um killed any uh scare of technology i have to say it sort of brought technology into the living rooms and and not only technology like art or let's call it cre creation uh, into the personal computers of of many people that haven't touched it before right so I think that's definitely what it did. 
before Diego asks uh, his next question, I should uh, mention that, you know, Christina recently, and by the way, Christina and Diego, uh, recently Artnet, the, one of the biggest strategies on the art market, they changed the name of their section on the Artnet News website from tech to NFTs. So I lost my permanent link. It, this link was, you know, uh, permanently stuck on my uh, in my web browser. So I lost that link. When I tried to renew it, I, I realized that's NFTs, not tech anymore. So right, it's it's the era of NFTs, and maybe Diego's question will be right. I have a, yeah. about that trend. Yes. So I think the the um, of course like. We see with all this, as you mentioned, uh, NFT is like coming mainstream. But you also mentioned before that blockchain art basically plays a role of curator, if I understand correctly, in the sense that you choose art like, to work with artwork that that will remain its value, right? So how do you navigate? How do you play the curator role in, and let's say, keeping at bay what is just hype versus working what builds value or the value that will be preserved? I, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm asking my, my, I'm done being clear. I mean, it's sort of, um, it's obviously something that is, is like a, not, not questionable, but it's debatable, right? To take on that role and to say, so we are, we are looking for, for good art. I mean, what is good art? Again, it's like it's going down that conversation. <clears throat> and we're not saying that it's like academic art or people that are, um, that are um, educated in one or other place or not at all. So that's not taken into account, right? So what <clears throat> also... Um, I or my colleague that does onboarding that we do, we actually look at the art and see, is there something, is there, is there a concept, is there a message, is it uh, someone who woke up this morning and wants to mint their cat, right? So it's, <clears throat> it's looking um, to take that uh, responsibility probably for, for um, our segment to to really choose something that we believe in will sort of pertain the value, right? So, and it's not um, to take that responsibility. This is what we do. And my colleague that is doing that with me, um, she is an artist herself. So she um, has been making art and uh, has, uh, has also obviously a way to, to work with artists, to talk to artists, to have an eye and to always challenge um, also. And I think that's that's the way we've chosen for us. And um, yeah, that's that's how we roll because we believe really in the value of, of art. It's, it's just wanted to, to follow up on, on that uh, note because I think that for something that is exploding, just as an NFT is exploding, it's great to have some players, right? Some uh, that that build benchmarks in the in the ecosystem, right? That that can have maybe not the traditional rules, but are also rethinking and innovating in the ways that art is perceived. Because it's just, I mean, I'm, I don't have an artistic background, of course, but. Um, as you say, is yeah, it's just not the previous rules, right? Is it can there could be new rules. So <clears throat> I I think that that's amazing that that there are players like blockchain art doing this role too. Not only having a tool to 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 bring the NFT to life, but also that player uh, creating um, role and and that adds value not only to to the artist or the intermediary, but also to the ecosystem itself. Exactly. So I think, and I definitely believe in um, multiplayers and people that, and other marketplaces that will go down the rabbit hole, right? So that will be specialized in the one or in the other thing. So I definitely see that coming and I always believed in that of specialty players, right? If you're interested in, in that particular 
segment or in that particularly particular topic that going further down the line um, that this is the thing uh, that that the market will respond and will respond with a shop fairly so to speak for you to shop your interest and um, also what I see is uh, is um, that at some point the hype will turn into special interest right so it's not that everyone will just buy whatever and uh, and uh, twitter influencer will say that this is the the hottest shit so i think this will also sort of even out with something like this pump and dump people will see this is pump and dump that's like sort of, sort of unless you are um, an hourly trader and just do it as a as a profession for now i think this is this is gonna be less attractive right so you have the you have the different fields and obviously there is also celebrity featured nfts that have it's like merch right so i don't know tom tom brady doing signature nfts that's like i mean look at it as a different form of merchandise right so i don't know he's been always selling shirts or shoes or whatever he's been selling so it's like a different sort of merch and that's fine and there's they have definitely a big reach of, of their own followers. And then you have, I don't know, sports or other collectibles of, of clubs or that has, besides any uh, cryptocurrency value, really a strong emotional value for the person who collects. And then I look at art NFTs and not only of sort of single editions, but obviously also series of, of things where this will have also a collectible value, right? An, an intrinsic value of that artwork versus any any uh, cryptocurrency attached to it. You know, uh, Christina, the the difference and the, the problem of recognition, the physical art and not art goes back to the Renaissance, to the 15th, early 16th century, to, to Florence. Uh, where the, the, as we know, the first curators appeared who used their knowledge and their uh, level of uh, understanding of uh, beauty to define art and, let's say, not art, as we, uh, I mean, um, getting back in 2021, we have so-called curatorial uh, marketplaces defined by art tactic and uh, cryptoart.io, the analytic website, Nifty Gateway, Super Rare, Async Art, um, Art Blocks, uh, Foundation, etc. And we have, uh, let's say, collectibles marketplaces like OpenSea and Rarible. Uh, from the one hand, uh, the first decacorn in the collectibles NFTs market uh, is comes from the collectibles NFTs, not let's say curated art marketplaces, OpenSea, 13 billion in capitalization. From the other hand, we see that uh, a lot of institutional investors and also uh, art moguls are investing into curated art platform platforms like uh, the Winkelvoss brothers and their company Gemini, they acquired Nifty Gateway, and as said, the Aquella family, Aquella Gallery is one of the most known galleries in the world. They uh, made an investment contribution to the foundation app, again, as said. Uh, so what's your opinion? I mean, uh, what's the future of the curatorial art NFTs or curated art NFTs? And uh, will there be the moment where there will be a strict recognition, strict definition, what is art NFTs, what is not? I mean, um, let's uh, go. And I, so I believe basically that um, every shop, every art shop or every gallery and every artist will be engaging with NFTs. So this is one. Number two, I do not believe in 
the continuation as it is now of the full price transparency of that every sale will be made public that you can always find uh, all the sales of every artist so i think there will be <clears throat> coming um, a lot more uh, individual approaches in in how to sell digital work so <clears throat> i think this will add um, a new customer segment and i think um, a different customer segment and uh, not not everything and in many times many times i also think that since the price <clears throat> of an nft or of an of a digital artwork so to speak uh, started to come first always so i think it it sort of takes away rather than adds to the conversation about, about art so i believe that price conversations will be made private, right? So I think many NFTs will start to change hands and a private, no one will know about it. People will start collecting big times. So I definitely see that coming. And um, also I'll see the limitations of sales of NFTs, just pure technical limitations of file sizes will also go away very soon. That means other artists and new artists will start to engage with that medium. So also a lot of the historic pieces will finally be made available as NFT and you can it can be purchased from a private institution, whatever. So uh, this is uh, this is what uh, what I expect. And um, Obviously, um, I mean, the market and, and galleries will invest in sort of startups that they believe in <clears throat> and that they want to see um, succeed. So, but as it will be just normalcy, right? So normalcy to buy an NFT and to buy a digital work. So um, I think also the prices will be fairly stabilized, right? And will have some, some sort of degree of... Um, of actually like stability rather than this pump and dump today it's i don't know 200 uh, ETH and tomorrow it's i don't know the half of it right and um i think this is something where we go to of the mass uh, adaptation thank you do you think do you think there's gonna be we're gonna start seeing what we see also in the cryptocurrency world where you're gonna you're gonna have like the big uh the the big uh let's say legacy or 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 very serious high market cap uh coins and then you have a uh, a bunch of trash coins let's say that are purely like uh let's say traded by teens or you know that do you think that's going to be a, that kind of separation but both worlds are going to coexist or you think that it's going to move and to the to the to the collect let's say more professional uh, collectibles and, and the other one is going to disappear. How do you see it? I think it's going to be, uh, so I think it's going to move far closer to the physical market than, than we expect, right? So if you think about prints, I mean, everyone can make a print and sell it in Etsy or on their Facebook marketplaces. So it's it can be my daughter or it can be, I don't know, your grandmother, right? So it's in a way, it's the same medium, it's the same tool, but depending on what is, what is the actual asset that comes with it. So um, I think the, the mass adaptation will just continue. So everyone will be engaging with it. And then what I'm especially excited about, so we're going to be talking actually about the work. So once the novelty wears off, we will actually be discussing. So have you seen this piece of that and that artist? And I don't know, it, it's sort of, have you seen, I don't know, the message, do you know, it's been really this, so many layers of artistic uh, messages are woven into that that's really complex this is really fantastic and this moved me so i believe all of that coexisting right so where more and it's not only artistic messages it can have i mean as we're looking at right now there's the DAOs are coming up many many different problems attached to DAOs, but 
obviously there we're looking at it as a process and these problems will be tackled or new forms will be coming up. I'm just saying this will all coexist. And in all of these various vectors, there will be sort of prize, like great prices. So for my daughter, she wants, she's making now NFTs for her sort of in her peer group to sell an NFT for like 10 bucks. It's like, woo, you know? So I'm just saying instead of the, the teenager and child and versus the artistic end or the social end of things where people talk about diversity. So it will have these different cohorts of people that are thinking and that are driven by their own missions and ideas and that want to pull in new clients. And I think this will be just like in this mass adaptation will just progress, will progress and price points will be established in one way or the other. Right. And then I don't know. And then celebrities will come in and sell their signature for more than anyone expected, but that's fine too, because I don't know, because it's Cristiano Ronaldo and he has the biggest Instagram followers. you know, it's, it's, it's that and, and sort of other prices from the artistic world. And this will be just coexisting. Well, I think we're, uh, go ahead, please. Then. Yeah, that sounds very optimistic. And on this optimistic tune, on this optimistic note, I'd like to ask the, the final question to you, uh, Christina. Uh, so our traditional question, would like to, to ask about the three tips that you can give to young entrepreneurs who are developing their art, tech, and NFT startups. So I think if um, talk to other um, entrepreneurs have really a strong report to other entrepreneurs in your field. Don't shy back of writing another entrepreneur that you think is doing great work and email and say like, let's have a coffee, let's do a Zoom. So really these conversations, I feel highly inspirational and will help you overcome, I don't know, roadblocks. Number two is don't you have a vision and base that vision on your experience your intuition and look for look for the logic in arguments right and have that vision composed in you and if you go in into meetings with potential investors with i don't know angels with other um thought leaders don't don't be thrown off your path easily right also if someone challenges you listen to the arguments listen why there is a challenge why do you feel you're being challenged and use these arguments for yourself and try to work with these arguments it will be critical and very helpful in uh in in going ahead and in num number three i mean fundraising is never fun Fundraising is the antidote of fun, but um, always go back to your Excel sheet and, and add people, do the work, do the work, put in the comments in your, in your um, pitch meetings, people will throw names at you. Yeah, they will throw names at you. You should be talking to that. And it's sometimes very tiring but still write down those names, research those names, put them in your Excel and go back to these names. It's like a workout. It's like these dreadful 30 minute runs that you hate, but you still have to do in order to move. So do that and you will profit from it and you will have something tangible at the end of, of your work. You will have that Excel sheet that is worth thousands of hours of your time and will be worthwhile for you to keep and to have and always go back to. I think these are my three ad uh, advices to, to entrepreneurs. Thank you, Christina. The, the, that was brilliant. The only thing, uh, as we are running out of time, we, can re we can't reply to all of the questions. We have uh, quite a few, but if to assemble them, as our assistant uh, writes to us, if to assemble one, uh, them in one, the main direction of the question is, first of all, it comes from the artists which is good. Uh, but the main direction is if, I mean, when being minted, 
as an NFT, does the real physical artwork which remains, does it lose in value? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a broad and very complicated question, actually. It's not, it's not, it doesn't lose. So it depends on what sort of mental school you subscribe, subscribe to right now as an artist, right? You can say, I, I'm the artist. I, uh, I consider the NFT priced at the same level and I control the market, meaning I will not, so I don't know, it's one of one, it's, it's one of three, and this is the price I make. But um, I would assume that the artist will um, sort of change, change paths after experience, right? So you sign up, you make a hypothesis, you test the hypothesis, and then you see if the hypothesis that you've taken is correct or not correct. So it is really a little bit in that space. Also as an artist, it's a bit of trial and error to see what works for you and what works for your art and what doesn't. But I, I can't uh, say it's, uh, that it devalues your original work. No, no, it doesn't. And um, I think it's, it's wise to look um, to actually make make actually understand. Do I really want to engage in NFTs over a longer period of time? And not only do I just try it and then it's an experiment. This is an alone standing case. But if you actually think about NFTs, think about a longer standing strategy that you want to engage with. So it's not only one NFT that you sort of put out, but is there a series of NFTs that I plan to put out? I don't want to steal more of your time, but that's no, it. no, it's it's your time as well. Uh, thank you, Christina. Thank you, Diego. That was an amazing conversation, and uh, we're moving forward with uh, Fuel Arts webinars. So stay tuned, subscribe to our newsletter and uh, Telegram channel at Fuel Arts. Um, also, next week we are starting accept inquiries for the two six weeks uh, courses of pre-acceleration program, which you personally call from idea to prototype. And uh, I believe that both Diego and Christina will be our mentors there. Let's keep that in secret uh, before the next uh, week. So one course will be devoted to uh, brick, brick and mortar art tech startup ideas in the sphere of uh, physical art. And the other will help to uncover the potential of NFT projects. Thank you and uh, see you soon. Bye. Thank you very much, Christina. Thanks for the enticing conversation. Look forward Thank to it. Thank you, Christina and Diego. Bye. See you at blockchain.art. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.